All right, let me go ahead and introduce Ray Ellingson. He is producer at Moving Pictures Media Group. And if you go back to Meetup and you look at the description for this event, you'll see that there's a link to his website, which I heartily recommend that you go take a look at. Tonight's event, Ray's going to be talking about minimum guarantees and working with distributors, things that you have to do in order to create a package that you're going to take to people who are going to give you investment or who are going to give you um, finance or capital funding or that you're going to use to get minimum guarantees. And Ray helps, in addition to producing his own projects, uh, he works with people to create those kinds of packages. And what it takes to create a strong film that's not just going to be something that gets funded but <laughs> also gets produced and then also gets distributed and then also, you know, theoretically even makes profit, which actually is the whole point of the exercise. So, Ray, do you want to talk just for a couple of seconds sort of about how you found yourself becoming an expert in building a package? I, I think it was sort of by accident that uh, the whole concept of packaging, developing and packaging came about. Uh, one of the partners that I started the company, Moving Pictures Media Group, with, he and I had spent a lot of years sort of stumbling around trying to figure out how to get things funded, how to get distribution. Uh, we, along the way, people would throw things at us like sales agents and producers reps and we sort of scratched our heads like monkeys at the monolith trying to figure out what all that meant. Uh, and then we did a few films, and it got a little bit easier. And um, So I think packaging and developing, I guess, if I could say an overall statement, and this ties directly into distribution as well and financing. Uh, packaging and developing, everybody has their sort of euphemistic idea of what that means, and everybody has their own definition. For us, it's really quite simply a laundry list of things that you need to put together in order to meet the requirements for funding and, in some cases, distribution. And that includes everything from starting off with forming a single-purpose entity or an LLC, assigning the rights to your intellectual property into that so that you can check that there's a clear chain of title. Um, you can do clearance reports on that, although that's a little later. Um, <coughs> there are other things that you need to do. You have a full, strong analytics package. You need to have a schedule and a budget which are bondable. You should bring on a producer's representative, which I believe is what we're going to discuss in a little more detail tonight. Uh, there's a lot of things or this laundry list of things that when you get to financing, they're going to ask these questions right out the gate. You know, who's your distributor? Uh, show me your analytics. Show me a schedule and a budget. If we call it film finances or LCI or, or uh, ProSite right now, are they going to bond this film with a completion bond? So you need to have those things in order, and that's part of the process of what we do and what we consult uh, other film clients in doing. One of the things that's interesting is even though a lot of times people go to film school, there's aspects of the business that never really get addressed. because There, there is certainly a learning curve, yes. When you talk about a minimum guarantee, so I think could you start addressing or could you address what exactly a minimum guarantee means and when when you can get a minimum guarantee from a distributor cuz i'd heard before previously that people said well you have to have a finished film before, and the, the distributor is giving you the minimum guarantee because now that he has the film it's like it was like an advance on royalties but i don't think that that's actually correct so can you sort of review what a minimum guarantee actually is from a pre-production standpoint sure. and how you get one Absolutely, and I think they used to. People used to say that you know minimum guarantees. They called them a lot of different things, but um, they really, in today's market, a minimum guarantee is simply, by definition, a distributor who's willing to sign a letter. It's a strong verbiage letter that states something along the lines of, "Upon receiving the following," and a complete de deliverables list, which we'll go into in a little bit. Uh, they would guarantee. X number of sales in that particular market, so the foreign market, the UK market, whatever the territory is that you're selling or licensing, uh, they would give you strong verbiage or a letter that says, hey, upon delivery of A, B, and C, we will guarantee X number of dollars in this territory or marketplace within this period of time. And that's loosely referred to as bankable paper. In other words, you can take that minimum sales guarantee to a bank like Pacific Mercantile or First Republic or any entertainment division bank, Comerica has an entertainment division, and you can take them that and they'll look at that, contact the distributor, and if the distributor is in agreement to that, it's a contractual obligation and the bank will loan you money against that uh, minimum sales guarantee. They used to so refer to them as pre-sales, but those pre -sales. I haven't seen a pre-sale in a half a decade. 
So. Right. So they're not they're not they're not promising you a specific amount of money. They're promising you a specific number of sales. But it's um, but, but it goes from the sales. Well, I, I've seen the language. Uh, I'm sorry. I've seen the language is we'll guarantee X number of dollars in the foreign market or in these territory markets within this period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, it depends on the language and the verbiage of the distributor, but the intent should be a minimum amount of revenue generated within that territory within a certain amount of period of time or months. And those things are based on talent, genre. Uh, you know, your budget plays a little bit into it only because of production value. And obviously they have very clear language that says if you do not meet requirements A, B, and C, then this contract's null and void. When you talk about building your package and you talk about cre bringing a project to the distributor, you have a film, a film analytics, which means that you go to somebody who specializes in seeing, projecting how well given films and given genres with given characteristics perform. Is that something that the distributors look at, or is it, or is it the case that they already know what kind of films they distribute without looking at the analytics package? Uh, I'm going to say this statement in hopes that there's no distributors actually on this call because uh, mm -hmm. they'll probably find it a bit offensive. Uh, mm -hmm. Distributors are perhaps the laziest people that I've ever met in film. In fact, I think I really missed my calling and should have been a distributor. Uh, <laughs> they do absolutely nothing if they don't absolutely have to. Uh, mm -hmm. They are really incredibly lazy people by and large. And what I mean by that is you can bring them a project, and they're terribly unimaginative about it unless you say, hey, it's got this, this, and this, and they automatically a light goes on in their head, and they go, oh, my God, that person last time we made, oh, well, okay. Mm -hmm. um, they will look at it, and if, if the light goes on in their head, they might react to you. Uh, they're also extremely cautious people with good reason because they're going to be on the hook if they make any uh, obligations financially toward you uh, mm -hmm. or on the bank. Um, so analytics as a part of that, if you can put together something from Baseline or Film Profit or Kagan Associates if it's television, uh, if you can put together a comprehensive analytics package which includes comparisons and trends and market analysis, projections, a metric built up on a tier releasing platform. In other words, in the first quarter we're going theatrical, in the second quarter we're doing delivery for broadcast, and the third quarter it gets released to uh, digital releasing or DVD, um, depending on the territory. Those things, if you can get that in order from a reputable analytics firm, we love Film Profit. They're one of the better companies out there in my mind. Um, mm -hmm. And if you can put that together and hand that to your producer's rep, which, again, I think we're going to get into in a little bit here, that producer's representative will take that to the distributors and pitch it saying, hey, look, based on this and you not having any imagination, we feel that these <laughs> factors will give you this amount of money in the world marketplace. Uh, mm -hmm. So certainly analytics can, you know, I think they're absolutely necessary to get people off of their posteriors and actually go do something for you in distribution. I always picture when I think of distributors, I think of Jabba the Hutt from Star Wars. Um, <laughs> just an image, just an imagery I have personally. But mm -hmm. I, so, I, well, um, go I've heard people, I've heard distributors say this is an actual distributor quote. He and it was a relatively large distributor. He said people shouldn't expect to see any revenue from us for at least a year, uh, and you know they'll see only correct. costs from us. You know? Yeah, no, no, I, and that's actually a fair statement, and it's a fairly honest statement. I've, my experience has been mostly 18 months. Uh, in fact, all of my agreements usually stayed 18 months, uh, and that's a fair assessment because, in you know, in the distributor's defense, which I see, you know, seems unlikely <laughs> in light of what I've said so far, uh, but in the <laughs> distributor's defense, they really do have to get it to market. They have to attend the markets, which are on schedules every quarter of the year, they have to put together press packages. They have to actually go out to buyers. They, I mean, they have their hands full if they're actually doing their job, and that mm -hmm. does take time. So a year is actually a very optimistic viewpoint to me. Mm -hmm. And you think that you th it, the um, one of the reasons it's important they give you a minimum guarantee is because it makes them more likely to be aggressive in distributing your film because they're on they are on the hook for a certain to delivering a certain quantity. Of money, you know, of revenue to you because they've made a promise to you. So as opposed sure. to if they just take a film that doesn't have any kind of a guarantee associated with it, you know, they're going to probably pay more attention to the ones that they're on the hook for versus the ones that they're not. 
Well, sure, and I think the films that they're going to give you a minimum guarantee for, they have to strongly believe in as well. I mean, I think they mm -hmm. look at those and they think, well, I'd rather get it than have my competitor get it, and I think it can actually make money in this, so I can probably weasel out a minimum guarantee of X number of dollars and be on the hook for it, and that's based on their experience knowing they can probably sell it. Mm -hmm. So when you, you talked about producers' reps, uh, and I think the last time we spoke you mentioned – so there – there's two different pe group people. There's producers, res reps, and there's sales agents. And do you want to talk about the difference between them? Because both of them uh, approach filmmakers at one point or another. And I, do they both require an upfront payment? Or um, is, uh, like, uh, what does the deal with the producer's rep look like? And then what is the, sure. what is, how do they work with the distributors? And, and, again, this is one person's opinion and based on my experience. So I wouldn't mm -hmm. take this as engraved in stone. Uh, mm -hmm. But from my experience, and I've been doing it a few years, a uh, sales agent usually will come on after your film is finished. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of sales agents, only because they usually try to bilk you for as much fee as they can up front. And the sales agents that say, oh, I'll work for no money up front, I'm suspicious of them equally, only because a good sales agent is going to go out and pitch things. He's going to travel to markets. He's going to really get behind your project because that's how he gets paid or she gets paid, uh, not mm -hmm. trying to be sexist here. Um, but they they will work for what they do if they're good. If they come on, and, and again, I'm leery of any sales agent who says, oh, yeah, I'll take your project on for no fees up front and I get X, Y, and Z once I sell it in the territory, mm -hmm. only because I don't think they're really incredibly motivated and those types of sales agents are usually packaging sales agents. In other words, they're piling together – as many used cars as they can to sell it just for scrap metal. Mm -hmm. um, and that's actually a really good analogy that somebody else gave me that I started looking at it, and it's really true. Uh, they don't care about your project. They're just selling content, and they'll lowball it to whatever price they think they can get. Um, I'm not a fan of sales agents because they're motivated to get the percentage in the territories that they work in. They don't care about maximizing the potential of your film in the world marketplace, well, some of them may, but the ones I've dealt with, unfortunately, do not. They're just looking at going after their territories, and they may actually screw you out of a lot of potential revenue. As an example, several years mm -hmm. ago, we had a project that a sales agent took on. They took it right to Canada, sold it to E1, and it was on broad broadcasted within three months, which killed mm -hmm. any limited theatrical. It killed our U.S. market, and it killed the UK, UK market for us. And wow. sales agent didn't care. They just cashed their check and moved on to the next project. By mm -hmm. contrast, a producer's representative, if they're, again, if they're good, they will come on. They will charge you a minimum amount up front, which usually just covers their expenses of travel and taking care of printing and binding and getting your project together. And they're usually very helpful. A good uh, producer's rep will come on board in development, work with you. They take a small fee in development against their fee in production against a percentage of back-end points or producer's equity in a shared first position with the other producers. Um, a sales agent, by contrast, will take a fee up front and then a percentage of sales, period. Mm -hmm. And they don't really care about you or your equity position or anything else. I don't think they literally, their motivation is to sell product. A producer's rep is what it sounds like. They work for the producers. And uh, are they in effect, and they're are they co they're compensated like a producer in the sense that they're Correct. they get a they get a sales percentage and then they get a percentage of the revenue um, that would the, what the producer gets after the sale of the project, which is over and above their fees and over over and above the percentage that they got for uh, negotiating a deal. No. Depending on the well, yes, the, that is correct to a great extent. But depending on the producer's representative you deal with. Some of them will take, you know, as a sales agent type fee, they'll get a percentage of sales. Some of them will come in as a producer's fee and get their uh, percentage out of the producers. It is, depending on who you work with, I work with, and generally I work with five producers reps on and off on a regular basis, mm -hmm. and every one of them has a different deal with us or with mm -hmm. the client. Uh, but generally they will want a percentage up front with, and, you know, anybody out there listening is going to say, well, how much am I going to have to pay up front? All I can say is this. You really, truly, with a sales agent or a producer's rep, you truly get what you pay for. Mm -hmm. um, if you pay nothing to a sales agent, you're probably going to get nothing because they're going to package it with 50 other films and they don't care. 
if you get a huge rate from a sales agent up front, I would say investigate them, see what they put to market, talk to some of their clients before you hire them. That's always helpful. And right. determine in your own mind whether that's worth it or not. When you're working with producers reps, do you have the right to sort of ask them, like, for uh, ask them what else they've distributed and get an idea, and maybe get contacts with their um, the producers that they've worked with in order to find out if they they are they do have a good reputation? I mean, it's I don't are they listed on IMDb? Is there a way to figure out what films they've distributed over time and those kinds of things? Um, I found it's kind of interesting with most uh, with most producers representatives that I've dealt with, they generally they don't care if people know who they are. They're working enough that they've got enough business. They're not out looking for it generally. There's a few mm -hmm. out there that are just getting started, which are you know really trying to make a name for themselves. Occasionally, you'll see a few producers' uh, credits on their IMDb. There is mm -hmm. no listing on IMDb for producers' rep necessarily. Mm -hmm. uh, it falls sort of under the line or guise of an agency, mm -hmm. uh, in the sense that you know any agent representation is the same way you find them uh, through. Uh, I think there's a Hollywood. I'll get the information to you so you can post it to your cool uh, to your members. But uh, there's there's a couple of uh, uh, websites and books that you can get on uh, producers, reps, and agents. Uh, there's the Hollywood guides to whatever uh, mm -hmm. agents or um, mm -hmm. so you can find those. Generally, any production company like our company or any out there. They've dealt with sales agents and producers representatives. They know which ones they like. They know which ones they definitely do not like. And if mm -hmm. you're working with a production company that has experience, then they'll be able to generally direct you to somebody that's reputable. Um, with regards to your first part of your question, as a producer's rep, can you check out and talk to their clients? Their client list is fairly confidential. However, the mm -hmm. reputation is pretty easy to suss out, especially in the electronic age. That's very good to know. I think that I think that's. Um the, inter the other thing about when you're working with a producer's rep, you sign in, once they're on board, they're, they are they are your producer's rep. Is it possible for you to fire a producer's rep if you don't like how they're behaving, or is the client is it Absolutely. kind of like having a co-producer in the sense that you no, can't that's actually get rid of really, them? No, that's a really good distinction, and that's a I'm glad you asked that because a sales agent is like a tick, an Alabama tick. Once they get on you, it's really hard to bleed them off of you. Um, they will hang on for dear life and all the way to court. Uh, a producer's rep is under a specific contract or contractual obligation, just like a producer's contract. If they do not meet the requirements or they are in breach of their agreement, and any good attorney can put together that agreement, um, then they can be released. And the release is usually, hey, what you've been paid is all you get. And since they're motivated to get into production, to get the bulk of their pay and to get through distribution, to get the bulk of their back end, they're usually mm -hmm. pretty motivated to do their job and not be in breach of agreement or contract. Uh, so, yes, you can get rid of a producer's rep. It's a little harder to get rid of sales agents, but they just won't go away. They're like relatives around the holidays. Mm -hmm. the, so, um, um, there's, is there any kind of – they don't have – there's not a standard – with agents, if like actors' agents or writers' agents, they have standard standard agreements and there are standard clauses because you have the people like the WGA protecting you or people like SAG protecting you. But it's not the case with the producers, with the producer's rep. There's no standard clauses or standard agreements that you can make. Every every deal that you do with a producer's rep is going to be different. And that's something – so that's something you should check in the language of the contract, which is how the – how what the termination process is if it ne if it becomes absolutely necessary for you to sever that relationship, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. No, that is correct. And you know, I think there's there's guys out there like there's a guy named I think his name's Litwack. Um, he has a mm -hmm. book on contracts, and I think he has a producer's rep and a sales agent contract listed there. You can mm -hmm. go online and look for them. Um, that's a little generic. I would absolutely bring in legal counsel to handle every agreement that you do, and not use some generic online you know, mm -hmm. ambulance chasing lawyers uh version of it. Uh they're I think a good idea to true. Yeah, they're a good idea to see what you're up against, but uh, I think you need to have competent counsel put together each agreement you have, whether it's a sales agent or a producer's mm -hmm. representative. I think that's definitely true. Um now so when it comes to so t now getting a minimum guarantee is can be a huge part of getting a uh, of actually putting together the package that you take to an equity funder or to um, somebody who does capital finance. So, 
what is it the case that you put the minimum guarantee in your package and then it's just there and the comp and whoever you're working with knows that you can monetize it or is it the case that you monetize it before you go and get the rest of your funding well and again every deal is a little bit different depending on how it's structured but in general I, and this is a generalization I think you can, if you bring on a producer's representative, they will go out and get you distribution. They have relationships with distributors. They will put together a, a game plan along with your analytics firm uh, and whoever's working with you as a producer. You'll put together a game plan which is comprehensive, which is here's how we plan to take this out to the marketplace. And mm -hmm. what you'll do is get a distributor behind you who will say, hey, look, I can get this, this, this territory. And once they give you that minimum guarantee, if your finance structure is going to uh, institutionalize finance, like a entertainment bank, then they'll have requirements. They'll know the producer's rep. They'll also know the distributors. And they'll be able to bank that money based on those uh, guarantees, minimum sales guarantees that they're offering. There is, however, another way to structure things. Uh, as an example, we're putting together a film right now, which has just been financed, which we're doing a limited theatrical release through... <laughs> Uh, a gentleman named Mark Bovey, who uh, he's the current uh, interim CEO over at uh, Carl Lindley Studios. Mm -hmm. He has a really interesting game plan for a 50-screen release, doubling it to 120, doubling it to 240 to 280. So they will run an independent theatrical release through AMC, Regal, a Cinemark. And if you're getting financing, a portion of your financing may come based on those types of minimum guarantees. You may have foreign sales minimum guarantees that put together another portion of that equity. And you may even have a tax incentive state like Georgia, and there's investors out there who will put up 30% of your budget, even though they know they're not getting 30% back, they're only getting 30% of the spend back, and they're not even getting that because by the time you go through tax title license and options, you're getting about 24% of your spend in Georgia back. Mm -hmm. But they'll still bank 30%. And those people, their collateralized instrument is the term that we're looking for, is the tax incentives on a bank, their collateralized instrument is going to be the minimum guarantees in either the foreign market or limited theatrical in the U.S., although they'll go after the foreign market first. And then that mm -hmm. part of the, in our case, this limited theatrical release, we had a private equity investor who came up, wants to put up the P&A or the prints and advertising, as well as support that theatrical release and get a portion back from that collateralized instrument. So, mm -hmm. and I think I may have strayed a little from your question, but mm -hmm. uh, overall, you know, it, and again, it's a generalized statement. Your minimum guarantees, it's not like you go out and get actors who will put letters of intent and then you go shop that and say, hey, look, I got these actors attached. This is more of a, as you strategize the method of distribution and each film is going to be different, you then put in place how important it is to get your minimum guarantee now. Do you go to the bank first and they recommend distributors to you? Do you go to the distributor first and they have relationships with the bank if that's who you're going through your equity? If it's private equity, you know, your producer's rep alone, his reputation or her reputation may be enough to secure a commitment for private equity funding based on you delivering A, distribution, and B, you know, whatever else, talent, or whatever else is on the list. So mm -hmm. what I've just done is sort of thrown a bunch of things against the wall, which are ideas of how things get financed and distributed and the places that that distribution and or finance play in, because there's not a specific order for all films. Does that make mm -hmm. any sense? Yeah, it, it, it definitely does. I think um, a lot of people um, may not realize or may not have been aware of what a patchwork it is to put together the funding for a film because it is patchwork, and you really are getting the minimum guarantees, and you've got to figure out and you've got to monetize those, and then you do have to get the the state rebates or the the national rebates if you happen to be getting money from overseas, and then it is a question of um, going to capital finance to turn that into cash. One question I wanted to ask, which I think is important to me, just because I care about um, I care about marking and I enjoy doing it. Is it the case that when you do um, a deal with a distributor, that they control the marketing for the project, or is it the case that you can you can do additional marking in order to support their efforts and increase the number of sales that they do? The only reason I'm asking is because I think that sometimes the best person to really push film has to, is really the producer is even more than the distributor, but I think it's the distributor's job. And it, they may not want producers interfering with their strategy for the film. Well, you know, that 
Yes, and that's sort of a two-pronged question, which I'll try to um, mm -hmm. try to answer articulately on both sides. Um, there, there's a statement that's been made that nobody will love your child more than you will. Uh, that mm -hmm. is the same with film. Uh, I think you know we had a picture with Lionsgate that we're taking out, and our deal was they would spend a X number of dollars on marketing. But mm -hmm. if we wanted to say push a limited theatrical release, they would step back and let us do that because it's just free advertising for them. Mm -hmm. um, they generally will work with you. Uh, most mm -hmm. distributors will work with you. And if you come in with a comprehensive plan, and if you're smart in your budget, you will account for some marketing and or social media and or awareness right. building in development. Mm -hmm. So they're generally on board with that. Uh, I've had very few distributors, a couple out of Germany, that have said, no, 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 we want to handle all the marketing. And you, you sit back and you go, okay, well, tell me what you're going to do. And they generally have a really good game plan because they need to get money back. Um, but overall, you will find that whether you're going straight to uh, digital delivery, whether you're going to broadcast, whether you're going to limit a theatrical and accommodation of you know, any and all of the above, you're going to find that most distributors will get on board with you and most producers' representatives will get on board with you and work with you to build awareness, even as far back as development. And mm -hmm. I'm creating a website, creating uh, you know, a social media presence, building it up so that people are aware of it. Most people listening will understand or relate to crowdfunding, i.e. Mm -hmm. Kickstarter, Indiegogo. All that is, is is a lesson in marketing 101 because anybody who's tried any of those and, you know, 28% of them are successful, mm -hmm. which, you know, that doesn't sound great because that means that 72% of them fail. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a sobering statistic, and why do the ones that fail fail, and why do the ones that are successful are successful? Because they had an audience. They had enough people that would go in and support that crowdfunding program, and it's no different than a film. You need that support of people who are going to go watch your film. And I used the example, I think, in our last discussion, mm -hmm. that you know everybody wants to go back to the Blair Witch analogy. Blair mm -hmm. Witch was not an accident. People go, oh, you know, I, I have a little, you know, forty thousand dollars film, and it's going to be just like Blair Witch. <clears throat> it could be, in mm -hmm. the event that you spend the one point two million dollar in initial marketing that was spent by Artisan, in the event that you have four million viewers on your website, which is what, uh, which is what um, that film actually had before it was picked up by Artisan. Mm -hmm. Blair Witch had 4 million viewers on their website. Um, and Artisan, that was an easy deal for them. They went, oh, built-in audience. Um, mm -hmm. So I think if you're you know, going back to dialing into what you asked, I think marketing is an important part of it. I think that most distributors will get on board with you. If you come up and you go, hey, I've got this great social media plan, and here's how I'm getting the word out, and they'll jump on board with you. And they want to spend as little as possible because they want to recoup mm -hmm. as fast as possible. So that's actually something you want to look at or have your producer's representative look at for you, which is how mm -hmm. much marketing and effort is this distributor actually going to put out. I think that's very true. Although it, one thing, the Producers Guild um, event is coming up. Um, the, yeah, PG, you know, Producers Guild event. It's, PGA, I think it's yeah. a Paramount again. But, you know, what's interesting is I was at the Producers Guild um, and the, at one of the tables with a distributor, and the distributor said um, – and I won't name the distributor, but it was pretty shocking because they said that when people use crowdfunding to fund their project and they promise people DVDs or access to the film, you know, when it's produced, they say them, yeah. that when we buy a film, we don't honor any of that. It's just mm -hmm. so, you know, they don't – and if if you choose to honor that and they, they won't distribute your project and if you do it without their permission, they will um, – terminate the agreement and sue you. So it's an interesting thing that um, I think many people think that they can crowdfund their film. And I think the common wisdom is that you can crowdfund your film and then still get just normal distribution for it. And it's not that it's just apparently not the case in any way, shape, no, means, or form. It is not. You've already committed yourself to a form of distribution. And now that you've stuck yourself to it, uh, you're going to have to get distributors who get in line with that or don't commit. And I think that's a very – whoever said that is really accurate. They, I think they have a really good handle on what that actual marketplace is. I think – I've heard a lot of distributors say, I don't want to get a crowdfunded film because I'm already in the hole. I'm not going to – you know, all these people are going to be coming at me that I owe them this, and I don't owe them anything. That filmmaker owes them that. 
Um, mm-hmm. It's more of a pain than it is a than it is an actual viable method. I mean, look, if you crowdfund and you raise money for your budget, and you're going to give everybody those DVDs and whatever swag they are mm-hmm. privy to, that's fine. But your distributor actually will have you sign an agreement saying any pre-existing condition, much like insurance companies, they're not going to cover. Right. Well, I think their concern is that once you, if if you promise them DVDs or copies of the film in advance then what you've done is you've created a version of the film that's now living in the it's it's not uh, that can be available on YouTube when they're trying to actually sell something you know because you gave yeah, them a copy right. of the and they DVD will, yeah they will void your agreement if it's if the product's already on the market then it has no value or no perceived value to a distributor right the other thing is i do think it's the case you could say look you know what i sold was tickets so when we have a premiere then I'm going to give these people tickets, and they'll go, okay. Well, when you have a premiere, you can give them tickets, but it's but th- that's a different thing. You're really just filling your first audience. But it's interesting because I never I hear people talking about doing crowdfunding all of the time without addressing the fact that it's going to screw up distribution. And I think it's I, on the one hand, I think it does prove a market to do crowdfunding, but on the other hand, I think you have to be really aware of the fact that there's things you can't promise people when you do it because of because you're creating something that. You you really will You're be creating a liability. To doing. Yeah. Well, you know, Absolutely. if you want, you could do crowdfunding, and then you can use somebody like Distribber to do um, video on demand distribution. Because I don't think Netflix cares if something already exists in the market, and I don't they're, they're I don't know if you're going to get like a great deal or anything with them, but I don't think they necessarily care. What they do care is that, um, or Amazon, it's like it's your content. You're just which is well, different it, though it than does a distributor. Come down yeah, it does come down to accessibility, though. If your full movie is mm-hmm. on YouTube, it's worthless. Um, you know, mm-hmm. it's worthless if it's been seen by a million people and you go to a distributor and go, hey, I've got a million people who have already seen this. Pick up my project. And they're going to go, well, that's a million less sales we just got. So I think you devalue it when you do yes. those independent type uh, marketing and or distribution methods. Right, I think it's something that you do only if that's going to be your full strategy from the very. I mean, if you're doing a Doctor Horrible distribution, he ne- he he basically sure. just put it up on Hulu and then drove traffic to it. But he, then again, he was Joss Whedon, and that does tend to work if you're Joss Whedon. So sure. um, absolutely. Yeah, um, the um, so when you talk about. So I went and did an analysis on the films between one and one and ten million, and the shocking. Did you know quite a number of them fail? <laughs> like, don't make their money back. I just thought I would tell you that, which you would probably you would probably know. But what's interesting is that um, there's actually not a huge number of distributors that actually work with the under ten million dollar film market, as far as I could tell. Yes. You know, there was I think there was what Lionsgate. Um, what Lions were they? They're not that many. Several divisions. Uh, they have Pantaleon for, say, Spanish content. They have, yeah, I think mm-hmm. they have five divisions that are independent film divisions. Uh, right. You've so got Weinstein's who have Dimension is one of the sub, you know, lower mm-hmm. budget uh, distribution outlets. Mm-hmm. Sony. So, yes, there's quite a few. Yeah, there's Sony yeah. has uh, three or four divisions as well. Yes. Right. Well, there's, there's, it's interesting because there's, there's there's quite a few, but on the other hand, there's like when, especially if you're talking about a theatrical release, it's not the case that there's a huge uh, like even any kind of theatrical release. It's not like the case that there is a huge number of people to choose from. So, which I think is another reason why you need to have a producer's rep work with you because it's not the case that you can um, pitch the project to somebody. It, Sometimes you can pitch something a million times and it's okay because there's a million people to pitch to and you'll get your pitch right by the time you get to the millionth person. But if yeah, it's okay. a limited number of people to pitch to, <laughs> you might actually have to get, you know, come up with something good before you get, you know, you sort of burned 50,000 people, you know. So yeah. uh, when you're working with the, with the producer's rep, that's one of the reasons that you're working with them uh, from the beginning of the project is because you're you're building what you're taking. You're building a good good thing to take to the distributor that's a well thought out comprehensive strategy not just um a, a one hit kind of yeah no i i you know i think there there's a lot of strategy and you know on that strategy there was something we sort of addressed uh, you and i addressed mm-hmm. earlier that we didn't bring up here um you mm-hmm. made a comment earlier about uh getting a minimum a sales guarantee and mm-hmm. how it could potentially create an unwise risk without it um, mm-hmm. And it, if you'd like, I can address that. 
I think that would be really uh, really good thing because I think um, the if if a distribute if I think people don't realize that a distributor is one of the things that proves market worthiness. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think you know if you're you know, I've had people come up to me and go, well, how important is a producer's rep or how important is a sales agent? Um, I think, and again, every strategy for every film is different. If you're going to take it out the crowdfunding market and you're going to put it on Amazon and sell DVDs yourself, then you may not need one. Uh, if you're going to go to any distributor at any point, if you're going to go to broadcast, uh, if you're going to go to any kind of uh, market, a producer's rep, uh, you want to get them on earlier than later, and the reason for that is, if you bring on a sales agent or a producer's rep at the end of your film, there's a limited amount of things they can do with it. They go, well, I'm stuck with the cast. I'm stuck with the story. Maybe I can edit it. The music's terrible, but oh well. The sound is awful. I can go recut the sound. But they're very limited as to how they can fix your project. And a lot of filmmakers go, well, I have to have my vision. Well, all right. Your vision may not, may not you know, be well received, but if you want to mm -hmm. stick to your guns, then that's great. But I think if you're smart you'll realize filmmaking is a collaborative effort. And bringing on a producer's rep, or, and I, I say producer's rep rather than a sales agent because they generally don't want to come on until after it's done because they don't care. They're just packaging widgets. Um, mm -hmm. But a producer's rep would like to get involved and go, hey, look, I'd like to have a say in the cast. I'd like to have a say in the strategy of bringing this to market. Um, I'd like to work with the analytics firm so that we can figure out how to maximize potential. And those things... I think, or like anything, in your last conference, you stated that film is just a business. It's it's a startup business, is what Michael Praver refers to it mm -hmm. as, and he's super accurate with that. Um, mm -hmm. I think that you need to. It is an unwise risk. Uh, you know, I think that you need to think this out as a business before you start. You need to build a foundation for it. So, anybody who thinks they can get away with cutting corners in development, um, you may be able to, but you sacrifice one critical factor which is irreplaceable, which is time. Mm -hmm. um, you will spend a lot more time trying to get your film to market without having all those fundamental components in place ahead of time. Right. So is it the case, like, is it the case that if you have, like, a, a, a solid $1 to $3 million film and all the forecasts from the, from the produce, based on the, what the producer's rep says and based on what the film analytics company says that you're going to make five, you know, five or more million, is, is it in your experience that they're usually pretty accurate about the, the fact that you'll generate the amount of revenue that they say? I mean, are they pretty good, pretty good at guessing um, based uh, on <laughs> factors? Well, I, I've been dealing with film profit for about nine years now. I know the president very well. Uh, mm -hmm. He has an interesting reputation in that in 20-plus years, he has never been wrong. And, you know, there's a couple factors mm -hmm. to that. One is he tends to lowball the analytics, which really pisses off a lot of filmmakers um, mm -hmm. to a great degree. You know, he'll come back, they'll go, oh, I got this great thing, and I think it'll make $100 million. He'll come back and go, well, you know, at $8 million, you're going to lose $3 million, but if you shoot it for $3 million, I, you can probably make 6 And, you know, they'll give you all these sort of strategies, suggestions. You have to implement those. But mm -hmm. they they generally will give you comparisons and trends in a market analysis, and if it comes in at $10 million, they'll probably quote you at reasonably, they'll do a low, medium, and high. They'll quote you the low first, the medium, and then the high as being fairly optimistic without lightning striking. And those numbers, most people look at the mid-range and go, well, it's $6 million. I thought I was going to make 10 They go, well, you may, but you're probably going to make this. And that's why they're always really accurate. They know they have their finger on the pulse of the market. They do this for a living all day long. And all they do is acquire data and analytics from all resources that's in real time. Uh, there's something mm -hmm. called rent tracks, and it's, it tells you within hours of how a film's performing at a theater in Ohio at the 7 o'clock showing. Well, and, and so, is it, isn't it the case, though, that not like a lot of films have really limited theatrical release these days, or is it the case that, I mean, that's kind of another really big question that people have is, how many films are getting theatrical release these days, and how many of them are making a profit in theatrical release in the in the under you know if it's a three million dollar film, how likely is it that you're going to have a theatrical release, and how much revenue does that actually generate? I mean, if you're doing most, well, I mean, the reason I, I ask it, is because that's the 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 numbers from theatrical release um, tend to it usually tends to be a loss leader for 
the project, and yet it makes the film more valuable because it had a theatrical release. Is that true? It is true. It's more awareness, uh, and because of that awareness, your distributors in the you know sort of secondary or sell through market will see that hey, there's a lot of awareness of this film, whether it made or lost money. People are aware of the name, they're aware of the brand, and so they can market that, and so your sales go up in the digital and broadcast market substantially mm -hmm. based on that. Uh, to answer your first part of the question, out, and I can't, t you know, although Film Profit and Baseline could give you the actual numbers, um, I would say that of all the independent films that go out there, possibly 10 to 15% of them will get a theatrical, limited theatrical release. That mm -hmm. number is actually being driven up substantially as of late because of things like Fathom Events. Um, mm -hmm. They have... You know, they used to be an event management that got into the theater screens, and I think anybody who's gone to see a movie in the last six months has seen this. Hey, have your event with Fathom Events, or you know, see some you know cats live broadcast simulcast from mm -hmm. New York on your theater screen in you know Dayton, Ohio tomorrow night. Um, so those Fathom sort of expanding out a little more, and there's a couple of other groups that are doing this, and uh, as I mentioned before. Um, gentleman named Mark Bovey, who uh, is over at uh, Carl Lemley Studios now, he used to be the, uh, he used to handle distribution for Universal for 20 years, all up and mm -hmm. down the Pacific Northwest. And, you know, he has access to 2,000 screens, and now he's parlaying that, and several gentlemen and women like him are parlaying those relationships and going right to the exhibitor and saying, hey, look, we got this great mm -hmm. little independent film, we're going to put our own P&A behind it, we want you to come on board because you have 16 screens sitting here and there's, you know, only so many tent poles a month coming out. And right now mm -hmm. you're showing the same movie on five screens just because you don't want an empty screen. Let mm -hmm. us come in, have an event, and we'll go ahead and simulcast to 10 screens that night or 20 screens or 50 screens. And we'll go ahead and handle all the P&A for it. And all you have to do is collect the profit. And if there isn't profit, then all you did was gave up a screen for a night. Um, so is it the case that you're renting the seat? Is it the case that you're renting the theater from them, and then you take, you, the, or is it, no, or? Uh, that's referred to as four walling, and renting mm -hmm. a screen is just an exercise in vanity. Uh, okay. It's useless. It has no practical value to a filmmaker other than you know saying you know assuaging their ego and saying hey I was on a screen. Um, you can get these deals with exhibitors that they will cut a deal of hey we're taking you know, X number of the gate and all of our concession, which you get nothing of, but we'll split mm -hmm. the gate with you. And Okay, you know, so it's 50-50 the then. Uh, just could be. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I, I say that with a bit of hesitation because depending on the screen and depending on the deal you put together and depending on how uh, desirable your film may be perceived by the exhibitor, that will give you a better or worse deal. Mm-hmm. So there's a there's a bunch of factors in that, and and again, like you know, with a producer's rep or any other agreements you put together, every single one seems to be a little different. Right, and there, I um, I think I a while back I talked to is it Rocky Mountain Pictures? They do theater booking, and they actually yes. book theaters. I got recommended to them by Cinedime, and they were yeah, which Cinedime. Used to be, is, yeah, I was going to say they're that's where they come from. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Cinedime's like uh, Fathom Events. They do the same type of thing. They mm -hmm. do theater bookings, and so. Getting back mm -hmm. to the conversation, there mm -hmm. are a lot more opportunities for filmmakers to get their films onto screens. However, that may not be a wise move for you. Uh, mm -hmm. As an example, we have a project right now uh, that we just licensed to Sci-Fi. Mm -hmm. And that project is going right to Sci-Fi. They could care less about a theatrical release. It's a waste of our time and effort to try to backstep it and put it onto screens because it has no purpose. It's uh, mm -hmm. as a pilot or a show. If it gets picked up, we'll get a 10-episode pickup for it, and mm -hmm. we don't really care. That is our mm -hmm. market. And then we'll have our producer's reps sell through the foreign market and sell through to Canada and everybody else in South America. So you do, t so you do, TV, you do TV as well as, to, as, well as um, film, or is it the case that this guy has a feature film and you can already see that it should be the, um, considered a pilot for a... Uh, or pilot, or, or you know, there's some films. Yeah, there are some films that are standalone features, which really only lend themselves to a broadcast market. A lot of mm -hmm. that is independent, lower budget comedies. Trying mm -hmm. to push that thing up the hill to a thea theatrical release, you mm -hmm. may find that it's more work than is potential reward. 
And so but, it's easier if you shot this thing for half a million dollars to sell it directly to even a standalone feature, not a series. Sell it to somebody like, uh, depending on the, the genre, sell it to somebody like uh, Lifetime or Hallmark, if it's that type of drama, and not worry about trying to get into the theaters. If it's a so, you know romantic comp. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, I'm just going to say. So you mentioned the figure half a million dollars. So that is that the case? Is that um, what you're talking about in terms of production, or is that what you're talking? About? You're talking about a comedy that's worth a half a million dollars, and you you're oh, taking it to sci-fi budget. or that was that just Your a budget? If you have a half a million to a million and a half dollar little independent, mm -hmm. say romantic comedy. Um, mm -hmm. The chances of getting that half a million to a million and a half dollar romantic comedy into theaters is extremely limited unless you had some really high-powered name that came on board mm -hmm. and you have some really high-powered distribution behind you that really wants to market this. So you're spending a half a million to a million dollars or a million and a half on a film. Your producer's rep will smartly say theater is off the table. You know, theatrical release is off the table. Don't even dream about it. And that's mm -hmm. why when I said earlier, I think it's 10 to 15 percent of independent films, and I think that's a high number. I think it's closer think to so five too. to 10 percent. Mm -hmm. I think it's closer to five to 10 percent. Um, and uh, the only reason I up that a little is because with these new emerging markets, uh, theatrical release is getting more and more prevalent, uh, only mm -hmm. because there's more and more screens, and they are screaming for content. You have. Mm -hmm. You know, little bijou theaters in all these towns that are these little independent screens that are playing secondary rate movies, and they're looking for anything interesting to make their mark. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of those surrounded, you know, a lot of those surround college campuses uh, all over the nation. So mm -hmm. that's bringing the number up just a bit. But I think if you're making a film and you're listening to this and you're going, hey, I'm going to make it a theatrical release, I think you need a producer's rep and some analytics and some distributors to maybe talk you down off the ledge and give mm -hmm. you a realistic approach of what kind of market and lifespan your film's going to have. I think that that's I think that's very um accurate. Is it's it's basically you need to have somebody who has experience in the market to in the market and in the marketing of the film to work with you to determine what the correct strategy is for your film based upon what actually sells because it, it it is the question of what people are willing to buy. And the other thing is that it's you know sometimes films come out and they Turn, I'm always really shocked when I drive past a theater that has the Rocky, the Rocky Rock Horror Picture Show, or Buffy's, you know, the Buffy Vampire Musical. You know, you're like, wow, look at that. You know, that's become well, an event. Who knew that was going to happen? It's weird. You know, it's like it doesn't mean you're never going to see your thing on a big screen. It just means you're not going to see it there right away. You know, well, if I you really want to no, see it on a big screen. You know. No, that is actually really. That's a really. Um, interesting distinction that you're making because you said mm -hmm. the key word it's an event uh mm -hmm. i have a gentleman that we deal with named tom vitale he has you know sort of claim to fame uh although he's done plenty of content that's actually wonderful content he's mm -hmm. best known for this uh film called sharknado <laughs> and who knew that would play in theaters tom certainly had no clue he was selling it off to sci-fi <laughs> and getting it as quick as he made it he was, in <laughs> fact, I think the day they wrapped production, somebody went, oh, you made Sharknado, and he went, I made what? Uh, what? <laughs> I think he just wanted to walk away from that film and never think about it again, and yet it constantly comes back to him like a boomerang. It plays, <laughs> Fathom Events does, you know, riff tracks with it almost every every couple months. You're seeing it on 50 to 150 screens, and it is just raking in money. Um, but that is the Rocky Horror Picture Show phenomenon. That is the, mm -hmm. you know, you get these things that are these oddball films that, you know, Plan 9 from Outer Space was one of the worst films ever made, and yet mm -hmm. every Halloween it's playing at at least 100 screens somewhere. Right. Um, well, you, the interesting thing is if you, own, if you own that intellectual property, you know, that's the interesting thing. If you own the intellectual property and it has this kind of life, you know, you, that, you know if you, assuming you didn't sell it off entirely to some distributor, you can enjoy these kinds of bizarre benefits <laughs> over time. But Because I've noticed the event thing as well, and I think it's because film in some cases actually is an event. And it doesn't matter if I've seen 1776 400 times. I still want to go into a theater and see it again with an audience so we can all sing along. I know it's stupid, but <laughs> that's what we're going to do. No, sure. And it's, you know. And that is it. You you've hit it in its event. If you want to create an event an event out of your mm -hmm. film, I would say most of those are probably accidents and unfortunately mm -hmm. those revenues 
are you know sort of received posthumously by the filmmakers. Um, Ed yes. Wood was long gone before his films ever hit cult <laughs> status and made money. Um, yeah. So you know that there's that to think about as well, uh, and also that your investors will never talk to you again if you make one of these events and it fails. Yes, that's totally true. I mean, I think it, I definitely think it's the case that it's just it's it is an interesting thing that happens sometimes with some films. It's just it's not the case that it, it's just not the the case that your your thing may never be seen in theaters. But I do think you have to go based on what's necessary for the sure. based upon what people know. So what I'm going to do is, and actually, what was interesting actually in that whole conversation was the fact that you, as part of your development plan, when a project comes into you, you you build a team that can actually say this doesn't want theatrical release or it needs theatrical release, um, and or this is this is something that needs to go to a distributor that's going to sell it overseas versus this is something that needs to get shunted right over to Sci-Fi right this very second. So you're in a position to make that choice. Yeah, and I had it's you know this is a really uncomfortable conversation to have with clients all the time, and I have them way too often. Uh, I it, as an example, I contacted Film Profit. I know the president Jeff Hardy pretty well. I sent up a film that uh, client had come on and asked us to get analytics on, and they were gung ho about this is going to be a theatrical release and it's historical and everybody's going to love it and they have talent attached, which is notable name talent. And mm-hmm. I sent it up to Film Profit, and I said, hey, you know, they're looking to do theatrical. Can you run some numbers? And he, Jeff called me personally one night and said, <laughs> hey, Ray, I just wanted to talk to you. And I said, hey, what's up? And he said, yeah, yeah, this film, which I'm not going to name the title of, said this film right now that you sent me up. And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, yeah, no. And I went, I'm, I'm sorry. Not at all. <laughs> he went, yeah, he goes, no. And I go, no, what? <laughs> and he goes, no, it's not going to make it in theaters. And, you know, I'm having this horrible moment of like, oh, great, how am I going to explain this to the client? And he said, it's just not going to work. And I'm like, well, uh, okay, but it's got this, this, and this. He goes, yeah, nobody's going to sit their ass in the theater. Nobody's going to drive to a theater, park, and go get popcorn and sit down and watch this stupid movie. And I went, ouch. Okay, then. And he goes, well, and, you know, it was really sort of like, and I, and I was thinking, is he off his meds? Um, and then he said, hey, there's this long silence, and I was, you know, getting ready to say, well, but thanks for the call. And he said, <laughs> however, as a miniseries, it'll be a blockbuster. And yeah. then, you know, then it was my turn for silence, and I went, uh, really? <laughs> and he went, oh, absolutely. And he named off ten shows off the top of his you know, mind, ten shows <laughs> for a similar genre that were hugely successful miniseries. And I had never thought of it. And then it took, you know, the going back to the filmmaker and giving them a bit more softer blow. Um, and it took them a while, but they got on board, and now it's being, you know, pushed as a miniseries. We have a producer's rep who's taking it. has already got a mm-hmm. possible commitment for a three-episode pickup. Um, and now we're doing what's referred to as a deficit financing deal with the distributor. Um, mm-hmm. And it looks like it's going to get made. But, you know, those things, and that's why I tell filmmakers, don't, you know, Film's going to be Don't what it's going to be, not what you want it to be. Yeah, and yeah. be open to hearing really harsh conversations. Occasionally. You know, it's, it's funny because I never had that. I have never had that um, desire. I mean, I, I just have never had the. I don't know. Just it's like you want to put the film where people are, where the right people are going to see it in the right context, and so it's not. I don't know what the big fascination is with putting it in a big theater. But then again, I've run it, I've done four walling before, you know, and actually when I did four walling, I did just rent the theater and I charged $20 per ticket, you know, and it was, it was a lot of money, 500, <laughs> however many seats, but it was just an event, you know? So for me, sure. it, it, it's not such a big deal to get something on a big screen, but for some people, it's like, it's not a real movie if it's not in a big screen. And I'm like, it's a real movie if it makes money. <laughs> That's how we're going to decide how real the film is. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Let's just make a little rule. Well, I, yeah, no, no, and I think that's you know that's important to to point out that you, you really, if you want your film to be successful, you know your first, everybody's first, you know, I guess loyalty is to their story, but I think their first loyalty should really be to their investors. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think you need to be responsible about that. And if you're being loyal to your investors, then you're not going to dig your heels in when somebody tells you uh, no. You're going to take a step back and go, well, great, how do I mitigate the risk of my investors at this point then? You know, and yeah. at that point, you should be willing and open to do anything possible or necessary to make sure that that film has the potential for success. Great. 
So actually, people um, sent in questions in advance. So um, uh -oh. some of them we've already answered. Like one was, can um, ask whether a script or movie idea has to be fully developed before the distributor can pledge support. And the answer is, um, I think, based on what you said, is that you should have the full script and you should have gone through the full analytics process. You should have producers rep on board. You should have a strategy developed about how this film is going to come into the world. And that's what, and the distributor, approaching the distributor is part of that process after you know what the plan is. Yes. Is that correct? Correct. Yes, correct. That's uh, well put. Cool. And then, let's see. This is kind of an interesting one. Three questions. So, one, is there a different minimum guarantee process if your cast members are people of color? And which is kind of an interesting thing. I don't know if it's still the case, but five years ago, or it might have been seven years ago, I was told really firmly that if you were doing something with a non with a a non white cast or particularly a non white lead, that whether you knew it or not, and even if it was a western, it was an urban film. <laughs> and that just had less distribution capability. It was the most crazy thing I have ever heard in my entire life. And I'm like, I like to think that that has changed, but I don't know that that's true. Is it the, has that's it changed? Is it easier to sell things now than it used to be if if um, you have people who you know a diverse cast? Well, I think you know, I, I think there's if you're and we have an African American based film that right now, mm -hmm. with the exception of the UK, we've kissed off a lot of our foreign sales. Uh, it is still, unfortunately, you know, which is a shame in the 21st century, unfortunately having an ethnic cast, although having an ethnic cast that's, say, East Indian opens up that market greatly. Having a cast that's Chinese opens up the Chinese market, which everybody should be taking a serious look at right now. Mm -hmm. um, it opens it up dramatically, not for theatrical release, but for distribution release mm -hmm. in the digital world. You will open up that market, but unfortunately, you close down another market. Uh, you know, the, with the case of the African American casting, you know, with our film, it's a faith-based film, so our U.S. distribution is going to be 80% of our distribution. We'll mm -hmm. get possibly some love in the U.K. because one of the uh, cast members that's involved is a big star in the U.K. Mm -hmm. um, but with the rest of the world, you know, China doesn't want to even look at this film. Uh, the pan-Asian rim could care less. South America, eh, they're lukewarm to it depending on the content. So mm -hmm. I, I think, unfortunately, that is the case. But you're, you know, your statement about it, an urban film, that is its own market in and of itself. So yes. it, I would not discourage anybody from making an ethnic-based film, you know, Slumdog Millionaire, an international success. Mm-hmm. Didn't there's no rules. Cast, but, there's there's yeah, no the, rules. It, I mean, to some, but to, but it's just the case that generally speaking, you have this problem of having to say. Correct. I mean, it, it, they really said if it was a western, it wouldn't matter. It's just that you are making it. it it's a, it was a code word just for not having a non have a having a non white star basically. Um, this person also asks, which is kind of interesting, um, and I think you part of your packaging process is you you do bring a casting director on as part of your team. Yeah. So in effect, you really do treat the, the building of a film as a startup. So you bring on a, 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 a development team, you bring on the casting director, you bring on the, the producer's rep, you bring on um, uh, a line producer, you bring on a first AD, if I understand correctly, it's, who works with the, the um, yeah, you have the writer on board and you have, a, you have a director on board if the director's not the writer. So you actually do build what amounts to, to a startup team which does include yeah. a casting director, and you need the casting director to be able to give you, to be able to work the numbers for bringing on the right talent for the sure, project. They, and you know, importantly, more importantly in development, they will get you your quotes and the talents available, but they'll work with the distributor and your producer's rep if you can get them to talk to each other. Um, mm -hmm. They will work with them to figure out if you have, say, an ethnic cast what your market for that is going to be. And so if you're going to a certain market, that casting director, if they're doing their job, will will angle that particular talent to match that market. In other words, mm -hmm. they'll you know, they'll go for an Idris Elba for the UK market because he can do no wrong. Mm -hmm. Um and that's you know, if you're going after an African American cast or if you're going after an ethnic cast, then that's where you want to go. Um mm -hmm. but you're Producers rep, your distributor, and your uh, casting director will all work in sync 
and along with your analytics firm. They'll all work in conjunction to help you build a better uh, better business. Mm -hmm. And then the um, he asked a question about getting the, the ratings of international stars with drawing power, but I think you would agree that you have to actually work with a casting director because that stuff changes routinely. It's not the case. I mean, there's a thing called, I don't know if people know, but there's a thing called the Olmer's Guide, which if you want, you can spend 150 bucks or whatever and buy, and it will tell you how much cast is worth you know, based upon the last X number of oh. films that they've done. But it's not a good way for you to cast your film, necessarily. You should work with a no, casting it's director. Not. It's, it's the same thing like on IMDb. They have, a, If you go into IMDb Pro, they have a rating of talent star and meter. where they fall. Yeah, and the star meter. And it, it's fairly useless. Um, you know, as, as a really sort of sad example, um, there was a film that was cast that uh, they went after Elizabeth Shue. And mm -hmm. her Q value was way up there. Her star meter was up there. Everything was moving. They couldn't give the film away. Um, yeah, it's, it's, so, it's not mean, the case. That, that, that it's just because it, it has to do with the genre of the film as much as it has to do with right. the, the – and the target market as well as it, it – there's a lot of factors that go into what the right, the right talent is. And also how easy the talent is to work with and how much they cost based upon the film. This is all these factors. You know. Yeah, and there, uh, you know, it is. It's that's exactly correct. That there's a lot of moving parts. So you want to in development. How important is development? Well, to me, it's. I've never been able to get a film successfully distributed without it. Uh, so I think one of those components of development is your producers' rep and your distribution. I think all of those have to mm -hmm. be treated with equal importance. Right. Now the other, um, the um, next question. Uh, somebody asked if you have an analytical firm, analytics firm that you like, and you've mentioned Film Profit, and there are others. But you, you mentioned Film Profit, and you've mentioned one that does TV sales, which is... Um, uh, there's Kagan and Associates, and then there's uh, Baseline, and there's one or two others that are out there. Um, mm -hmm. I think if you're looking at the top three, you know, top one for television is probably Kagan. Uh, if you're doing mm -hmm. feature content or international comp content, you're looking at Baseline and Film Profit, and really... I'm not going to pitch one over the other only because it's a relationship that you're building. Um, mm -hmm. I personally have a better relationship with the president of Film Profit. We've known each other nine years. I, I deal with the guys at Baseline. They're great. I have no problems mm -hmm. with them. So somebody asked, what's the uh, dollar range up front for a producer's rep? Is it something – I mean, you can't really generalize, but would you say that, it, <laughs> would you say that it's, uh, um, it's, it's in I, the thousands or tens quotes, of thousands? Mm -hmm. If I give quotes by tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock, I'll probably have a half a dozen producers' reps screaming at me, but I will give mm -hmm. this as a ballpark just because I don't want to be vague and ambiguous here. Mm -hmm. a, and depending on your level of producers' rep and the level of commitment, a good mm -hmm. producers' rep, if they like your project, will work with you on the funding. But you're generally looking at about five to $20,000 up front against a fee as a producer during mm -hmm. production and or and I say and or very carefully understand that, and or a percentage of sales on the back end. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, I, 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 you can maybe find them for the lower below 10, but figure your plus or minus 10,000 at a wide range depending on what you get. And I have to emphasize this. You really get what you pay for with a producer's rep. In effect, you're building a startup business, so you have to basically put the stuff in that's going to make the business successful, and you're going to finance most of the stuff anyhow. You're putting together development, and people ask me, you know, I am surprised mm -hmm. this question didn't come up in this, but people ask me what does development cost, and it can cost you $10,000, it can cost you $200,000. It depends mm -hmm. on what elements you feel are critical to get your project out there. The mm -hmm. ballpark for our company is 50 to 100. I really cringe going over 100 because you have to pay that money back. Um, mm -hmm. But having said that, if you're going to treat this like a business, uh, we we deal with um, we deal with a finance facilitator, which you you have had on your conferences before, mm -hmm. Michael Praver. They have the op I mean, they've helped dozens of our clients get funding, and their clients. Uh, we recommend clients to them constantly because they have. If you qualify, they can get you fifty to one hundred and fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollars in lines of credit so that you can create a business. If you're going to start up a small business, you have to get loans. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have great um, 
they actually their follow through is really phenomenal because they help you chart the use of these lines of credit, how to pay them down, how to manage mm -hmm. that money. Uh, we work with the clients to put together a strategy for getting reimbursed for that. There's no mm -hmm. free money that you can shake the magic money tree and it'll fall out. But if you are smart and you want to treat this like a business, go to somebody like Michael Praver's company. They can get you that money, and if you're smart about it mm -hmm. and you have a strategy, you work with their company, you work with somebody mm -hmm. like our company, you'll have a way to pay that back, mitigate your risk, and get your film made. If you correctly are accounting for development costs, they're repaid when you actually get quite a Capital funding. I have a question, Nancy. Do, do your uh, <laughs> members have access to Michael com Michael's company? I've found a lot of my clients say, how do I get access to funding? And I, I throw mm -hmm. Michael's phone number at them all day long, which I'm not sure if he, <laughs> not sure if he appreciates or not, but uh, he may <laughs> curse me more than he thanks me. But. I love it. I'm happy to help anybody, and I, I love this combination of the trainer and the funder mm -hmm. and the guide to actually making the films on one call. It's a wonderful um, collection. So let's, is, let's do more of these. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, so let's go ahead and call it an evening, and if anybody has any other questions, is there anything we can do to make your life better, please do reach out to us. We, all of us, all three of us answer questions just because we like to answer questions. So if you have questions, there's no reason for you not to ask them. So I hope you guys reach out, and thank you very much for um, attending and for joining, uh, for joining the meetups and coming and attending events. It really makes a big difference to us. Uh, thank you, Ray, for your time so much. And, yes, and Nancy, you did a wonderful nice. job. Thank you. Very kind to say so. All right. Goodbye, you guys. Have a nice evening. Good night. Thank you. Good night.